thank you very much for coming to the uh, to our uh, research seminar um, dialogues on philosophy and technology. And um, um, this series um, titled Dialogues on Philosophy and Technology um, will run from this fall uh, of 2021 until uh, to uh, spring 2022. So this series is initiated by my own research project supported by the City University of Hong Kong and in collaboration with Research Network for Philosophy and Technology. And the idea of this research seminar is to interrogate the relation between philosophy and technology. So it's not, it's not limited and it doesn't intend to be limited in what we call the philosophy of technology but rather to um, bring technology and philosophy, but also science into dialogue and to uh, ask um, um, what, what are the, the, the place of philosophy, but also uh, the, possibility, the possibility of philosophy in the contemporary technological uh, condition. So, um, This will be our inaugural seminar, and we have the I have the great pleasure to uh, inv to to um, invite uh, Professor Kathleen Malapu to uh, be our first guest. So I think most of you know already the work of uh, Kathleen. So I'm not going to say too much about her work. I just want to do a brief introduction. So Kathleen uh, Malapu is a professor of philosophy at the Center for Research in modern European philosophy at Kingston University, London, and a professor of comparative literature and European languages and studies at University of California, Irvine, where she regularly teaches in the spring. Catherine is author of numerous books, and I just want to mention two of them. And, uh, uh, her, her earlier work on on Hegel, the future of Hegel, plasticity, temporality, and dialectics, with a preface from Jack Derrida, published in 1996. Um, I believe it's one of the rare attempts to give Hegel a future, and it has become an, an unavoidable path to any contemporary discourse on the question of the Geist. And her, her recent book uh, on Kant before tomorrow, Epigenesis and Rational Rationality, pub published in 2014, uh, I, I believe is one of the finest uh, Kant scholarships that I have uh, encountered in the recent years. And Catherine is right now writing a book on anarchism and philosophy, and I'm extremely curious about is a new book as well. So today, um, Kathleen is going to give us a, a, a talk titled Epigenetic Mimesis, Natural Brains and Syn Synaptic Trips. So after her lecture, we are going to have a dialogue uh, and a response to Kathleen's talk. Uh, and after the, after the dialogue, if time is allowed, we are going to uh, open to uh, Q and A, and um, for about this online event, that uh, please use the Q and A chat to type your questions, and then we choose the relevant ones or, 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 uh, towards the end of the dialogue. Um, and also, this lecture will be recorded and. Uh, um, we also hope to or wish to make available on the Research Network for Philosophy and Technology uh, websites and uh, YouTube channels. So um, I wanted to give the time to uh, Kathleen uh, and for her, for her for talk. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Yuk, for inviting me to this seminar. I'm very honored. Um, and uh, Hello, everyone. I, I don't know if I have to say uh, good morning, good evening, etc. So hello, everyone. So as, as you just um, said, the title of this talk is Epigenetic Mimesis, Natural Brain, Brains and Synaptic Chips. So without further ado, I start. So first, I will expose a few remarks about epigenetics and the epigenetic development of the brain. 
In a second moment, I will turn to technology and what I call the epigenetic paradigm in cybernetics and IA. And all this talk will be oriented throughout toward the concept of mimesis that I propose to sketchily and tentatively explore and perhaps redefine. And the last movement of my talk, the conclusion, will expose this redefinition and develop some philosophical reflections. So let me first situate the general context of my presentation. Current neurologists are speaking of an epigenetic turn in the history of neurology. This turn is linked with the scientific revolution that took place in the 80s and revealed that the brain, far from being made of fixed and rigid localizations, is, on the contrary, plastic, that is, undergoing continuous changes and rewirings. The power of neuroplasticity has provoked a very important mutation in the definition of the brain itself and of intelligence that still challenges all attempts at considering it as innate and just genetically, genetically predetermined. So the problem I intend to raise here is that of the mimesis of these epigenetic capacities of the brain by the most recent developments and achievements in cybernetics and artificial intelligence. So I say mimesis, I keep the Greek term, term because I don't know how to translate it yet. The usual translation is, as we know, imitation. So can we say that artificial epigenetics, that I will of course define, is just an imitation of the natural one? More generally, what do we mean when we speak of imitation when it comes to cybernetics, artificial intelligence, or robotics? Don't we need a new concept in order to characterize the specific mode of copy, to use a platonic language, of the natural by the technological? A concept that would definitely and precisely break with the platonic definition of mimesis as a production of copies and simulacra. This is what I intend to determine. So first, as I said, a few words about natural epigenetic. On 15 February of 2001, the American scientific journal Nature published the virtually complete sequence of the 3 billion bases of the human genome. The result was surprising. The human genome is made up of only 30,000 genes. In other words, just 30,000 more than Drosophila, that is a, a fly. So, we have very few coding, co coding genes. Only 5% of all these genes uh, are coding. In fact, all the genes are assembled in bunches and clusters, separated by vast expanses of what is called gene deserts, made up of DNA called junk or repetitive, that is non-coding. According to studies, this non-coding DNA accounts for a quarter or a third of the totality of the genome. This means that within chromosomes, there are long DNA sequences, which according to current understanding, do not appear to match the genes and cannot be given any particular function. So the sequencing of the human genome did not offer the expected revelations. On the contrary, it indicated the weakening of genetic determinism. So we are then witnessing, since then, the demise of the genetic paradigm in favor of a new one, that is the epigenetic one. So what is epigenetics? It is a science that is currently dramatically transforming all previous conceptions of determinism and inheritance. The branch of molecular, this branch of molecular biology, epigenetics, studies the relations between genes in general and the individual features they produce. In other terms, the relation between the general uh, genome, which is the genotype, and the individual phenotype. Each of us are a phenotype. So epigenetics is derived from epigenesis. Uh, and this term, epigenetic, 
is a neologism created in 1940 by Conrad Waddington, the British biologist. I, I quote Waddington briefly. He says, some years ago, we were in 1947, I introduced the word epigenetics derived from the Aristotelian word epigenesis, which had more or less passed into disuse, as a suitable name for the branch of biology which studies the causal interactions between genes and their products, which bring the phenotype into being. So epigenetic mechanisms concern the expression, transcription, or translation of the genetic code into the phenotype, that is the biological unique constitution and physical appearance of an individual. These mechanisms, the epigenetic mechanism, are act essentially through the activation or silencing of certain genes, that is through a series of modifications. This change, these changes in gene expression that do not involve changes to the underlying DNA sequence are both chemical at the internal level, but also environmental, because these mechanisms can be influenced by several factors, including age, the environment, lifestyle, education, etc. So to use a metaphor, that is very simplifying, but very also enlightening. If the DNA is like a book or a musical score, epigenetic mechanisms are like the readings or the interpretations of the book or the score. So in the second half of the 20th century, as I said, after the sequencing of the genome, the concept of program that dominated genetics, as we know, uh, slightly uh, went into disuse. So the idea of a program is exactly what is in question today with the acknowledgement of the importance of epigenetic mechanisms. Epigenetic means non-programmed if we think, as I just said, of the non-predictable character of the influence of the environment on our phenotypes. And we also know that brain's development is for its most part epigenetic. It continues long after birth and depends, as I just said, on uh, many, many in, um, environmental and cultural factors. I quote from a book called The Mind and the Brain, Neuroplasticity and the Power of Mental Force. The authors say, although it would be perfectly reasonable to posit that genes determine the brain's connections, just as a wiring diagram determines the connections on a silicon computer chip, that is a mathematical impossibility. As the Human Genome Project drew to a close in the early years of the new millennium, it became clear that humans have something like 30,000 different genes and about half of them seem to be active in the brain. Call it the genetic shortfall, too many synapses, too few genes. Our DNA is simply too paltry to spell out the wiring diagram for the human brain. So neurobiologists agree that, I quote again, the brain is more than a reflection of our genes. And it is more because once again, synaptic development is never the mere implementation of a program or a code. For a long time, I have been convinced that the epigenetic nature of brain development was what definitely proved its irreducibility to technology, that is to AI systems or to any cybernetic or robotic processes. Was not epigenetic cerebral plasticity the perfect intermingling of the biological and the symbolic that marked its difference with technological functioning. What I mean by intermingling of the biological and the symbolic is the indiscernibility between the biological development of the brain and the influence of personal history on this development itself. That is the intermingling or the merging of materiality on the one hand and sense of the, on the other between chemical mechanisms and exposure 
to changes, education, adventures of life, experiences, etc. All these issues could be, I thought at the time, uh, unified, summarized in one, what should we do with our brain? Uh, and I, uh, I thought that at the time when I wrote this book, what should we do with our brain, that we could precisely do something with our brain because precisely it was not a machine. Because our brain, because of its epigenetic development, had a self, uh, a self that the machine could not have. So I've been thinking like that for a long time. That is this difference, this irreducibility of the brain to a technological device. However, and this is the second part of this talk, the recent developments in artificial intelligence and cybernetics woke me up to speak like Kant from my dogmatic slumber. It was a shock for me to realize that I was wrong, that my book, What Should We Do With the Brain, with our brain should be revised and perhaps entirely re rewritten. This suspicion brutally came up to me when I read an article about, um, about sorry, the most recent computational architectures and particularly about IBM's recent design of a totally new type of chip called the neurosynaptic chip. The title of the article was Eloquent, it was IBM's neurosynaptic chip mimics human brain. In clear, IBM was releasing a neurosynaptic computation chip, chip that was able to simulate the neurons and synapses of the brain. Up until now, as we know, most computer chips have employed a von Neumann type architecture that is the mathematics based system at the core of almost every computer built since 1988, and that executes instructions in series. By comparison, the synaptic chip is made of different neurosynaptic cores or correlates that function autonomously in a non-synchronic way so that those which are not solicited remain inactive, thus resulting in a lower energy use. If such a functioning is said to mimic the brain, it is because this chip allows interactions between neurons, that is the elements of calculus, synapses, that is memory, and accents, communications with other parts of the chip. And the second reason is that the electronic synaptic components are capable of varying connection strength between two neurons in a manner analogous to that seen in biological systems. So in a certain sense, the system develops what we might call its own experience. I discovered this new cybernetic uh, functioning 10 years ago already. It was in 2011. Dharmendra Moda, the founder of IBM's Cognitive Computing Group at IBM Research, developed with his team, the first cognitive chip, thus concretizing the Synapse project, Synapse project uh, developed by IBM, Synapse for systems of neuromorphic, adaptive, plastic, scalable electronics. The ambition was right from the start to develop low power electronic neuromorphic computers that could scale to biological levels. Uh, the chip that the first chip that came to light was called True North. It was made of 4,096 neurosynaptic cores and was able to simulate around 1 million neurons and, uh, and synapses. I, I quote Moda If we think of today's von Neumann computers as akin to the left brain, fast, symbolic, number crunching calculators, then true north can be likened to the right brain, slow, sensory, pattern recognizing machines, end of quote. So true north correlates were designed for sensory applications that included things like artificial noses, ears, eyes, and adaptable, and was able to rewire synapses 
based on their inputs. So the development uh, of those chips has been dramatically, has dramatically increased in the last uh, years. It is an exponential growth. So in a recent article uh, dated from well, this month, October 5th, uh, article called Self-Learning Neuromorphic Chip Market to Witness Astonishing Growth. Uh, this article was devoted to an even more efficient IBM chip. And I quote the authors of this article, neuromorphic chips come with artificial neurons and artificial synapses that mimic the activity spike that occurs in the human brain. The chip has the ability to learn continuously due to its synaptic plasticity. This results in smarter, far more energy efficient computing systems. Self-learning neuromorphic chips perform on chip processing asynchronously. It uses event-driven processing models to address complex computing problems. Further, by combining improved onboard learning, reduced latency, and improved energy efficiency, the self-learning neuromorphic chip can push the image recognition and speech processing to new levels of speed and accuracy. So sorry for this long quote, but as you can see, uh, the development of these chips uh, seems to be the future of uh, cybernetics. So uh, what I uh, concluded from uh, this development is that we can consider that cybernetics and IA have also made their epigenetic revolution, contrarily to what I thought when I wrote, uh, what should we do with our brain? Because in cybernetics, also, the concept of program, very surprisingly, is not that adequate any longer. The new systems, like the IBM ones uh, just mentioned, are able precisely to change their programs as they adapt, as they can vary, as I said, their, their, uh, their energy, etc. And we can also think on that point of recurrent neural networks. Deep learning is more akin to epigenetic than genetic development. And in his book, this very, his very famous book, uh, Singularity, Kurzweil constantly insists, as we know, on the exponential growth of computing capacities and speed. He speaks of a paradigm shift in terms of quantity, but he also uh, speaks of a qualitative shift. And this qualitative shift this qualitative singularity is epigenetic, the epigenetic uh, revolution of artificial intelligence. That's why, according to him, the singularity, what he calls singularity, is also that of the plasticity of machines. And plasticity is not here, we understand, a metaphor or a way of speaking. A quote from Kurzweil, he says, human intelligence has a certain amount of plasticity, that is ability to change its structure more so than had been understood. But machines to come will also be plastic, more and more plastic, he says. They will be capable of changing themselves. Once machines achieve the ability to design and engineer technology as humans do, only as at far higher speeds and capacity, they will have access to their own designs, source code, and the ability to manipulate them. So I think this is what is important. The machines will have access to their own designs and the ability to manipulate them. Uh, another quote, ma machines will be then able to reformulate their own designs. So we see once again that it means that the notion of program is here uh, totally challenged. So now let's turn to the issue of mimesis. Uh, in the aforementioned article about synaptic chips that I already wrote, uh, quoted, sorry, the authors write, I quote again, neuromorphic chips come with artificial neurons and artificial synapses that mimic 
the activity spike that occurs in the human brain. So how are we to understand mimic here? We all know well the usual questions that are constantly uh, addressed when uh, anyone talks about artificial intelligence. We know these questions. Will IA systems replace us? Can a computer really be intelligent? Can it really simulate a brain? Can it really do better than us, do better without us? Uh, I remember Hawking's fear, Stephen Hawking, uh, when he said at the BBC, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. And most of the time, people try to comfort themselves by affirming that machines uh, only imitate the human, but are not able to really replace the human. So it's a double discourse. On the one hand, it is the fear that machines could replace us. And on the other, it is yes, but uh, this is not possible because machines are just imitating uh, the human and in particular the human brain. But this imitation is just a copy and it won't work. It won't work because machines, this is the uh, argument I hear uh, most often, uh, machines cannot feel Machines cannot be affected because they don't have a self. So where are we in the uncanny valley of intelligence? Because uh, we know the debates about uh, the resemblance between robots, the physical resemblance between robots and human beings. But what about the uh, cerebral uh, resemblance between the machines and uh, human brains. Uh, where, where are we in this uncanny valley? Uh, what is exactly brain simulation? What is artificial imagination, artificial creativity? What is, in one word, uh, artificial epigenetics? Hmm? As a philosopher, I must say that um, I am very embarrassed because I think that philosophers currently do not have many concepts to correct um, the meaning of imitation that is expressed in the popular questions I just mentioned. We still have the old concept of mimesis uh, elaborated by Plato. And in fact, we, we did not really progress uh, from then we lack an appropriate notion of mimesis in order to characterize artificial epigenetic systems. Uh, even if the concept of mimesis has evolved through time since Plato, of course, it has remained attached to it, uh, it for a major part. Uh, it has remained attached to the old problem of the relationship between physis and techne and more precisely between nature and art. So let me very briefly insist upon two decisive moments in the history of mimesis, the Platonic moment, of course, and the Kantian one. As I said earlier, Plato's notion of mimesis refers to the problematic of copying and reproducing. It entirely revolves around the status of art understood as fine art, painting, sculpture, poetry, etc. So for sure, art for uh, Greek philosophers is a branch of techne. Mm -hmm. uh, Aristotle will say a bit later that poiesis uh, characterizes art and poiesis is of course comprised in the general category of techne. But in fact, when Plato speaks about mimesis, he never has in mind uh, technology. He has in mind art. My Mimesis is always artistic, never technological. For example, the craft worker that makes a bed does not imitate uh, or copy anything because the idea that serves as the model for this making is directly imprinted in the craft craftsman's mind without any possibility of ruse or interpretation. The artist on the contrary, uses intentional deceiving processes 
in his or her production of copies and reflections in order to intentionally blur the frontiers between the actual reality, the natural reality and its image. And thus intentionally once again, turns the idea or eidos into a mere simulacrum and idolon. So I think that many critics of AI today unconsciously retain something from this platonic conception, but they, they apply it to technology while Plato, as I just said, applies it to only art. So today the questions like what um, a machine can just copy the human mind, in fact uses uh, Plato's definition of art as a deceiver. That's why for many people, um, the original, that is nature, that is the biological, is necessarily superior to the artistic, that is in reality the technological, because of its authenticity. And the technological mimics cannot be compared to um, these original models. That's why, once again, the notion of uh, epigenetic, of artificial epigenetic, for most people is untenable because it cannot compete with cerebral epigenetic. So Kant's concept of imitation is more complex and more interesting, I would say, but still insufficient for settling our problem. Let me expose it briefly. In the first part of the critique of judgment, that is the aesthetic judgment, he affirms that fine arts must find their topics in nature, but not copy nature. So interestingly enough, Kant uh, separates art from mimesis. Such is the reason why he defines art as a creation of genius. Art finds its inspiration in nature, but it interprets it. It reinvents it, so to speak. So art is in this sense, contrarily to a mechanical, purely technological process, a production of freedom. It means that a work of art is never a servile copy. It is not plagiarism or a counterfeit. Uh, it is a free imitation. In, and in that sense, Kant disagrees with Plato. He has, Kant has this puzzling declaration in paragraph 47, a very interesting paragraph from the Critique of Judgment. He says, nature must serve as a model, not for copying, but for imitation. And that's very interesting because for the first time, imitation is separated from copying. And Kant uses two terms in German uh, for uh, uh, imitations, he says, nachahamung, and for uh, copying, nachmachung. So two terms, true imitation and servile imitation. Nachahamung for uh, free imitation and nachmachung for uh, the counterfeit. However, as we know, if art is a production of genius, genius per se is not intrinsically artistic. Genius is a gift from nature. That is from the very topic that art has to take its inspiration from. I, I recall the famous definition of paragraph 46. Genius is the talent which gives the rule to art, end of quote which means that through artistic invention, it is in reality nature that interprets itself. As Jacques Derrida writes in his text, Echo My Mises, I quote Derrida, the secret resource of my Mises in Kant, so my Mises in his very beautiful sense of Nach Amun, the secret resource of my Mises is understood not in the first place as an imitation of nature by art, but as a flexion of the physis, nature's relation to itself. So what Derrida tells us here is that in fact, the secret resource of mimesis is the mimesis of nature by itself because art is a gift from nature. So 
uh, my mesis is in reality nature's relation to itself and the world self is very important here art helps the creation of a self of nature art is what puts nature in relation to itself and thus makes something like a self of nature emerge so to the extent that artistic mimesis is a gift from nature it means that the, this return of nature to itself exhibits a self of nature that is a proper mimesis, an authentic mimesis. This economy, this economimesis between nature and itself is a much more complex and interesting concept of imitation than that of the platonic copy. Because it is positive, because it is complicated, because it is a way uh, that authenticity, it is a way for authenticity to establish itself through the relation of nature to itself. And we can consider that Kant invents the idea of a self of nature. So you will ask, what is the relation between this and technology? Because it is clear that right from the beginning, Kant excludes technology from this economy. Mm -hmm. uh, for him, technology is uh, purely mechanical. And it is true that in the second part of the critique of judgment, uh, <clears throat> he clearly opposes technique to life. A living being is organized like a work of art. So it is plastic, it is a, it, it is a free uh, production of nature. And on the contrary, the techno, well, the technical uh, mechanism is precisely just a mechanism. It is never plastic. And I refer uh, on that to paragraph 65, a very uh, famous where uh, Kant compares the living being with a watch. I, uh, let me just read a few lines from this paragraph. So it's paragraph 65. In a watch, one part is the instrument for the motion of another, but one wheel is not the efficient cause for the production of the other. One part is certainly present for the sake of the other, but not because of it. And in, on the contrary, an organized being, that is a living being, is not a mere machine, for that has only a motive power, while the organized being possesses in itself a formative power, that is a plastic power. So you see the difference for Kant between a machine and a living being is that in the machine, the parts uh, convene together, but are not self-created. Uh, they depend on external causes, which is the, the, the machine maker. Rather, in a living being, all parts are, in a certain sense, creating each other. That's why Kant uses the term epigenetic development to characterize the living being only and never the machine. So that's why Kant would certainly have considered synaptic chips, plastic computing processes, as watches, that is, mechanical nachmachungen of the biological cerebral organization. He would have said, no, uh, synaptic chips are like a watch. I mean, they imitate, uh, in the sense of nachmachung, they imitate the living beings, but they depend on and external uh, causes. The problem, and what we might uh, answer to Kant, is that it is not true because the internal regulation of the different parts of the watch, it is true, is not the work of the watch itself, but the internal regulation of current cybernetic processes are their own, so to speak. As we just said, uh, the new systems are able to adapt themselves to, as Kurzweil uh, just said, redesign their own functioning. In that sense, the comparison with the watch is inaccurate because neural networks, for example, are their own, they create their own processes. And when we speak about own, when we, when we use the word own, then we are very close to the word self. And this is my question, hasn't 
technological self-regulation become a regulation of the self? Isn't there today something like a technical or technological relationship of technique or technology to itself? The emergence not only of a technical self, but of a self of technique. That's why in, in uh, my opinion, when people say, uh, machines cannot imitate the brain because they don't have a self. Perhaps they don't have a self, but they have a relationship to themselves. Uh, and it seems that this dimension is what is totally absent from the usual questions that we hear from people. Um, it is as if, I think, AI, for example, was bringing to light not just an imitation of natural intelligence or a ruse, uh, sorry, sorry, was bringing to light not an imitation of natural intelligence, not uh, nature's relationship to itself, but the relationship of technique to itself. It seems to me that, of course, there is a dimension of imitation of nature. Uh, the uh, synaptic chips are mimicking the human brain, the natural human brain. But through this imitation of nature, it, a relationship of the system to itself is also emerging. And this breaks with just the paradigm of imitation of nature. So that's why I think we have, what we have to interrogate today is not only the relationship of the machines to nature, but also the nature of the relationship of this relationship to nature. Is technique's relationship to itself just an imitation, nachmachung, of nature's relationship to itself, an art of reflection, or on the contrary, the production of an artificial self through the nachamung of this relationship, a technological, authentically mimetic self? So I now conclude, uh, and of course I will uh, be very happy to discuss that with you uh, in the Q&A. If it is true that AI systems, deep learning processes, or intelligent robots are clearly imitating the human or the natural biological functions like epigenesis, for example, we cannot stop at this level only. We cannot return to a platonic concept of mimicry or to a Kantian notion of genius. We cannot consider either, as I just said, that these artifacts are new versions of fine arts, that is of the relation of nature to itself. We have to go deeper and wonder whether behind all these appearances, there does not exist a new form of epigenesis, the epigenesis of an auto-affection of technique by itself just like nature mimics itself, itself through art for Kant, it seems that technology today mimics itself through nature. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I hope that was clear. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for the uh, wonderful talk. Um, so um, I have many questions, but I think I'm going to uh, um, to, to limit my, my response and why I'm responding and making my response, maybe the audience, I can also formulate their questions. So I, um, so first of all, thank you very much for, for, your, for your talk. And I think it's very rich that uh, uh, you bring in, um, you bring philosophy, technology, but also biology together. And this is for me very significant. And I think that this might be the most important thing that, uh, uh, that we have to address, but also one of the biggest challenge to philosophy. So maybe I will respond. I have many questions, for example, concerning the definition of intelligence, the relation between intelligence and uh, technology and so on. But I think I will just uh, leave aside and maybe we we'll come back later. I just want to, spec uh, to, to, to specify my response in two main points. And um, 
but these are also questions for you for yourself. So I want to start with the, ter the, the two terms that you use in your talk, epigenetic and mimesis. Um, the two, in two very interesting terms because mimesis exists well, since the very beginning of philosophy and epigenetic is something that has haunted the transcendental as you uh, uh, demonstrate in your book on Kant. So let me firstly start with the, the term mimesis and uh, I'm wondering if philosophy is not searching in vain in its past a possibility to address or accommodate something that it didn't anticipate. And here I want to refer to, um, to uh, because this, this, the term mimesis, uh, which we can find already in Plato, but it's uh, Plato's uh, concept of mimesis, of course, is also different from that of uh, Aristotle's, uh, because for Plato, we see art as the imitation of imitation of, of the form. And in Aristotle, maybe we, we can say that there is a positive definition of mimesis as when Aristotle in, in, in book two of physics, he says, I quote, in general, human skill either complete what nature is incapable of completing or imitates nature, end of course. So this is uh, the famous defini definition of the art of the art imitatus natura. And how this uh, um, th this concept of my methods of nature uh, uh, stay after Aristotle, and still we perceive, for example, uh, when we when we think about artificial intelligence, cybernetic machines, we are thinking of a certain kind of imitation. You know, this motif still stay with us when we think about contemporary technology. And here I would like to, I, 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 I'm wondering if my message, this, you know, the term my message is still legitimate or relevant to describe uh, the technology that we are dealing with. Um, or historically speaking, is not this term my message already kind of, uh, um, losing its ground and its, its capacity to, to describe this relation between technology and nature. Now, I refer here specifically to an article by Hans Blumenberg uh, called Imitation of Nature, the uh, Nachahmen der Natur. Um, this article is very relevant here. Maybe I can, I, I, will, I will brutally or violently reduce the point uh, of Blumenberg. But so what Blumenberg is trying to say is that if we if we consider uh, after Christianity, so what comes after Christianity is the concept of creation. Creation, because if we say in Aristotle that the human being was an annex to nature, right through the concept of creation, that the human being is it already has the same status as nature. Um, already he found, so uh, again, I could, we cannot go into details, but he, dem he tried to demonstrate, for example, already uh, in the work of, uh, of Nicolas de Cousin, uh, Nicolas of Cousin, there is a different concept of imitation, and that is not the imitation of nature, but something closer to creation. Uh, so for him, the, the Christian tradition, um, um, the concept of creation in, 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 in Christian tradition and also the, 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 uh, the, the perception of the relation between uh, uh, human humanity and nature, technology and nature has significantly changed. And why if we look at, for example, in the 19th uh, century, or let's say from the early European modernity on uh, of the opposition between technology and nature, uh, whether these two are opposed. Uh, um, and we see that there was a process when technology was subordinate to nature as an imitation. And later, for example, in the 19th century, where let's say already in the work of Hegel, that uh, the, 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 the distinction between Geist and nature it's already very clear that nature is the source of contingency. And I think if someone asked the question about contingency in Aristotle, maybe I can link 
here is that for you know as you know very well in the book on Hegel, the Hegel thinks that nature is the fibrous in 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 the concept you know, because it's enabled to resist, it's not uh, capable of resisting contingency, while uh, the the artifact, for example, was able to resist contingency. But of course, it's even uh, more the case when you find in his logic. So uh, it seems that this this uh, term imitation or imitation of nature is also in the uh, slowly historical historically losing its ground. So um, is imitation still a proper word uh, that we can use or uh, maybe I, I I wanted to refer here to what you called a uh, speculative automatism, and I wonder if this is speculative automatism, not a uh, even better word to to think of this uh, of of the contemporary technology that we are having, uh, AI and uh, cybernetics, um, um, because maybe that also can also take away. You know, from 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 the illusion that we it's possible to find a certain concept that uh, sufficiently they can sufficiently sufficiently address what we uh, what we what we are witnessing now. So this is the first point regarding uh, my Um The the second points I would like to uh, mention is the um, um, is is the question of epigenetics and. Um, uh, and I have to mention, I have to say that your 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 work on Kant, on especially your interpretation of paragraph twenty seven of the Critique of Pure Reason, on the epigenesis of the system of reason, is such a a powerful and significant work and that also give me a new perspective to connect with what I have been doing on 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 Kant and uh, especially my 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 my. On theory on uh, on recursivity because I think that it, uh, this concept of recursivity can 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 be in dialogue with a lot of your work, um, but let's uh, stay with this question of epigenetics and uh, of course epi as you already emphasized in your book the epigenetic is different from epigenesis okay, but it's it's the concept of epigenesis of the system of reason that. Uh, you discuss in your book, then I think that it threatens, if it not haunt, haunts the uh, the transcendental in Kant's critique of pure reason, and 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 isn't that all? And um, until critique of judgments and that Kant's trying to try to confront this epigen epigenesis which haunts him in the uh, critique of uh, pure reason and that continue in the critique of practical reason. They're only in the uh, critique of judgments that can't formulate uh, a, a kind of epigenetic or epi epigenesis through his notion of reflective, reflective judgment. Um, a reflective judgments that's a fundamental for his understanding of both the aesthetic judgments and uh, teleological judgment. Now, and it is precisely on the question of the uh, reflective judgment, we can, where well, here I want to take the reflective judgments as something close to what you call the epigenesis or can't call the epigenesis because the reflective judgment is, a, is an operation that starts from the particular in searching for the universal, the universal is not given, but there is always a, a, a self-learning, a, a, a kind of recursive process of, of returning to itself, to know itself, to advance. And that also allows Kant to articulate, which you, you, you mentioned in your talk, the, 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 the irreducibility between machine and organism. Now you in the talk in the talk you say uh, Kant's um, technique, but um, if we check the um, the etymology of Kant's use of the term technique in the judgment, actually it means mechanism, um, and um, the opposition between machine and organism that was fundamental to Kant's critique and to his understanding of the epigenesis of reason. Uh, this is also a theme, a very, very important theme uh, in uh, 
George Cohen Glenn's 1947 article, Machine and Organism, which you quoted also in, in, uh, in, your, in your book. And we, we know that Kant in the, pre, uh, in the pre critical time, he was already amazed uh, when, when he asked in his pre, uh, pre, pre, uh, pre critical period that how was an animal body possible at all? You know, how was the animal body possible at all? And I think it's only in the critique of judgments that Kant was able to resolve this question and explain what does it mean by uh, epigenesis and org in organism, especially in paragraph 64 and paragraph 65, where he used a tree as example to explain, as what you already mentioned in your talk, that an organism is first of all characterized by the reciprocity uh, between parts and parts and parts and the whole, the gun's height, uh, but also the capacity of repo repossession. Um, so um, this is the distinction that Kant made uh, between machines and organisms. And I would say that this is also the foundation. Um, this is a very decisive decision or distinction made by Kant and that also stay after Kant, you know, the, the opposition between organism and mechanism, you know, very rare in Hegel, in Schelling, and, and, and even in Whitehead, even today. So, but something I would like to, to, to mention is that uh, how this epigenesis uh, is related to epigenetic of, uh, of, 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 of Conrad uh, Waddington, that, um, um, that, that uh, um, because my, my my own study, uh, especially in recursivity and contingency, I tried to trace how this concept of the organicity uh, continues up to Kant, and especially it was appropriate in uh, modern biology, and one of them is uh, Conrad uh, Waddington. The Waddington, of course, Waddington belong, first of all, to uh, what we know now known as the uh, theoretical biology club, which was a group dedicated to study of organicism um, before the Second World War in the UK, with members such as Joseph Woodgate, uh, uh, Joseph Needham, and, and, and others. And Waddington uh, was very much influenced by Whitehead, especially his organismic philosophy. So. Uh, there is a strong link, I, I, I think, and I try to analyze between his concept of epigenetic and, and the organismic philosophy. Uh, of course, this was reflected in his experiment with, uh, um, in, his ex in, in his experiment with uh, Drosophila, you know, the, 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 the fly, the fruit fly that you mentioned, the experiments that he did in 1942, trying to stimulate the uh, phenotype of the, of the fruit uh, fly. Um, so, uh, but what I'm trying to say is that with, from, epi, from epigenesis to epigenetics, even though there is a different, you know, there's a difference in, in the strict scientific articulation, but uh, for me, they belong to the same pa paradigm of thinking the operation of organisms. And this, this um, operation of organism, uh, which was very much distinguished from mechanism, as you said, that, you know, for Kant, mechanism means a watch, a clock. But today, you know, we, we cannot say that. Uh, uh, because a decisive moment happened, which is 1948, with the advancement of cybernetics, that um, Norbert Wiener, in his work Cybernetics, uh, where I want to just to specify on the first chapter, titled Newtonian Time versus Bersonian Time, that Norbert Wiener tried to claim, I, I'm re, I, I reduce all the details, um, Norbert Wiener tried to claim that cybernetic machine is capable of overcoming the dualism between, on the one hand, mechanism or classical mechanics of Newton, and on the other hand, the vitalism of Bresson. And maybe we don't have time here, but maybe it, it will be our focus. But maybe, maybe later we can talk about the concept of intelligence in Bresson. Um, that for Wiener, the cybernetic is able to overcome uh, the the dualism between 
uh, vitalism on the one hand, on the other hand, mechanism. That is to say that cybernetics is the realization of an organismic thinking, of an organismic thinking. And this was endorsed by the organist uh, biologist, for example, Joseph Needham. So the, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, from epigenesis of the system of reason of comes to epigenetic of Waddington, and uh, at the same time, in the same period, uh, the emergence of cybernetics, and later the employment of cybernetic model, you know, the feedback that going back to itself, you know, where you end your talk, um, become a, a, a paradigm of technological development, which, which we can find today in machine learning, in artificial intelligence. So uh, what I'm trying to say, the, the, the point what I'm trying to make is that this distinction between, by, between machine and organism that was fundamental to philosophy, to the post-Kantian philosophy, it seems today that when we are trying to address these machines, that this opposition no longer stand uh, as it was the time of Kant. And it seems that it's, so isn't philosophy that after Kant also kind of collapse, collapsing with this collapse of the, uh, of the, of the relation or the opposition between machine and organism. And therefore that uh, there is a, a kind of urgency to think uh, the, 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 to, to rethink about the, the position or the, the, the direction of philosophy today, um, especially when we when we confront this uh, this um, these machines and what you're trying to describe to us. So these are the main, two main points that I would like to discuss with, with you. Uh, the term mimesis, um, and secondly the um, epigenetic, uh, but more you know it has to do with uh, the role of philosophy, the position of philosophy, and the relation between philosophy and technology today. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you, in fact, you said two questions, but in fact, the, the <laughs> there is uh, more than that. And thank you so much for this very rich um, response. Uh, I will try my best, not of course to answer everything, but to try to um, make my way uh, through your uh, reflection. I totally agree that my Mises is much less adequate than speculative automatism. I, I started with my Mises because, um, because uh, people keep asking me, and I suppose you have the same experience, uh, asking me whether, once again, machines can imitate, you know, they, they try to always lower the importance of artificial intelligence by saying it is just a mimesis. So that's why I started with this term. But I agree that speculative automatism is more adequate. Uh, so this brings me back to Hegel uh, because I wrote this, I, I invented in a certain sense, this concept of speculative automatism in my book on Hegel. And I will um, answer also uh, to what you said about epigenesis through Hegel. Um, Ego says uh, that the, you're right, the dualism between machines and organisms that Kant is, is uh, still uh, maintaining is not uh, adequate to spirit, to the spiritual development. Why that? It is because thinking itself that is philosophy itself, that is the speculative, what he calls the speculative thinking is already automatic. So the, 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 the distinction between uh, the mechanical and the art, art and, the, um, and nature is a false dualism because the problem of technology has not to be situated at the level of imitation of nature, but at the level of thinking. Thinking, well, Hegel doesn't go as far as to say thinking is a technology, but he says that uh, the speculative, that is thinking, is automatic. That is, he says, it works out of itself, by itself, out of itself. It is not, we are not thinking subject. We are thinking because of this, it thinks of the speculative 
itself, what Hegel calls precisely the self, das selbst, huh? the self, which is the real, uh, and the real is already technologically developing itself as an automatism. And this is what Hegel answers Kant, huh? that we have to go much beyond, much far beyond this um, uh, art, nature, mimesis model uh, dialectic. Um, but when Hegel says that, it is a critique of Kant, of course, but at the same time, it helps seeing what Kant exactly said about uh, epigenesis precisely and about nature and art. If we uh, retrace the genealogy of epigenesis in Kant, it is true that it appears, as you said in paragraph 20, 21 of the first critique, epigenesis of pure reason, that is the production of categories, but it's only a few lines. And then it is developed in the third critique about um, in, in the uh, Blumenbach sense, that is the biological sense of the development of the living being. Many critiques of Kant, many readers of Kant think that in fact, the, uh, uh, the epigenesis that is developed in paragraph 21 is a metaphor of what is developed in the third critique. That is that Kant has in mind the epigenesis of a living being, that is the development of the embryo, the differentiated development of the embryo. He has this in mind, and then he applies it to the production of categories. But I think that he's much more Hegelian than he seems, because on the contrary, I do think that it is the epigenesis of categories uh, that is the model for the analysis of the living being. That is that, uh, in fact, Hegel, by insisting on the fact that thinking is already epigenetic and thus technical, in fact, he just uh, helps us to understand that Kant already had this idea. That is that true epigenesis occurs, as you said, at the level of the transcendental, that is the level of the production of categories of thinking, and that this is the model for organic uh, or biological epigenesis. But Kant perhaps was not really aware of that himself. Perhaps Hegel helped us to understand that, that in fact, it is always the transcendental that is already always already technical. Uh, so when, you, when you're asking very interestingly, yes, but then if um, the machine organism competition, so to speak, collapses, then what remains of philosophy? This is a true question, but I would answer, everything remains to be, to be built. That is, uh, we have to um, develop this idea that in fact, technology is not contained in the machine organism uh, scheme, but is thinking itself. And I think Heidegger already had this idea that technology is not a zone, it's not a region, of, um, uh, of being, it is thinking itself. Uh, and there is no way in which we can separate the speculative from its automaticity. And in that sense, uh, the epigenesis of thinking, epigenesis as thinking um, is indiscernibly natural and te technological. Um, and that's why very often, uh, Hegel's system is compared uh, to a machine. But for me, it is a compliment. It, it is not uh, a critique. So these are, I'm sorry, very briefly the remarks and very <laughs> chaotically uh, the remarks I wanted to make. Uh, that in fact, the, the problem of my Mises, you're right, um, is not really adequate because the model, the real model that epigenesis, natural epigenesis imitate is the speculative. I mean, it is the uh, epigenesis as thinking, as the speculative, that is the model for um, the biological. Okay, so perhaps uh, you, I don't know what you think, but we might open the floor or, or maybe you want to add something? I don't know. I, I, I just want to add one point. Yes, of course. 
I just say one simple point. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, one is that um, uh, the relation between Hegel and the machine, I don't know if you are aware of a book, a very, spe uh, a very interesting book, it's called, um, it's written by a German cyberneticist and a Hegelian called Gotthard Günther. And this book is called uh, uh, Metaphysics of Cybernetics. Oh, really? And Consciousness of Machines. And this book is uh, a proof that uh, cybernetics is the realization of Hegel's logic. <laughs> yeah, that's very so, interesting. That's I have a, to really, have a look at that. Yes. Uh, I, I, yeah. And, and I, I do think that's the case. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I also wrote about that. And I think it is a very, 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 very interesting statement uh, uh, from, from Gohard Gunther. Um, the, 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 the second uh, point re regarding my methods, I think that maybe also bring us to, you know, some thinking together with Heidegger in the way that if we think of my technology as my methods, then uh, technology technology is still a human affair. You know, is technology still human? No, you're right. You're right. But but but, but if when, when we think of what Heidegger was saying, to, you know, towards the end of his career, uh, that the technology uh, is not is not a human affair. Uh, technology is the grimesness. There is something, there is a force that is also become kind of autonomous in technology. So that, that may also you know, bring us the difficulty of, of, of using the term my message again. So this is just, uh, some, a simple uh, note for that, right? So, um, well, there are many questions. <laughs> they are already there. We have sixteen questions. So, um, how, how what would be the most effective way that we choose these questions? I don't think that you can answer all these sixteen questions because there will be too much. So, uh, uh, what should I do? So maybe should I choose one question for you and then I keep on. Searching? I can. Um... Um, if, if there are 16 of them, I think we can go through them quickly. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, um, yeah. uh, I don't know uh, if all of you can read, well, uh, I don't know if all of you can uh, read the Q&A or only uh, analysts can read the q and I have no idea <laughs> whether everybody can um, read the Q&A. Uh, okay. So, I don't know if everyone can read the Q&A. But so, maybe I type the Q&A on the... Uh, let's see if people can see the Q and A as well. Right, so people can see Q and A. So maybe I try to read. Uh, should I read the first question? So then I. Yes, I, yes. I mm -hmm. So I first question I find the Professor Malabu's theorization of epigenetic mimesis as a self-regulating process of establishing its own condition of possibility really similar to the concept of recurse, recursion. Professor Hoy proposed in recursive and contingency as a returning to itself in order to determine itself. I wonder if Professor Malabu and Professor Hoy would see the concept of epigenesis and recursion would be parallel to each other in its self-referential -refer structure and its self-regulating ability. My second question is, I wonder if the concept of epigenesis and recursion have already encompassed this technological condition of AI or the AI revolution have challenged the validity of these two concepts. Um, I, well, I don't know what you think, Hugh, but I think this is what you and I agree on that perhaps recursivity uh, and uh, self-regulation and epigen epigenesis are synonymous more or less, don't you think? Um, yes, I, I think, uh, uh, well, I, 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 I try to, as for you, I try to work out different models of recursivity. For example, uh, we can find a recursive model in Frista that is different from the recursive model that we found in sh in shelling because if it's yeah. not uh, ish and uh, niche ish and in shelling in shelling is not the uh, there is the identity between uh, the the ish and natura uh, and in in the Hegel the recursive model 
is also a bit different because shelling and filter recursive model starts with the, the absolute, but Hegel's recursive model doesn't start with the absolute, the absolute is at the end. So I would say that uh, well, there are different recursive models, even though we, we say this, you know, we call them returning itself, itself. And um, my, in, my, in my recent work, I also tried to articulate and there a recursive model that we can find in Taoism, in the Taoist logic, in the, uh, because in, in, in many philosophers, when they talk about Taoism, they were speculating if Taoism is a Hegelian dialectics, and I try to show that no, and that there is a different kind of recurs recursive model. So, so in general, I would say that uh, because the question is that if the concept of epigenesis and recursion have already encompassed the technological condition of AI, for me, uh, in my own development, I would say yes. It, it does already encompass, and I try to enlarge the concept of recursion uh, beyond our uh, the current understanding of cybernetics. So that, that's also my, uh, my answer to my question to you, mm -hmm. Catherine, regarding the, 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 the possibility of philosophy itself. Uh, okay, um, I think we, we just skipped two questions. The first was, um, you say that technology imitates nature, wouldn't it be correct to say that technology imitates time? rather than nature, I don't know if you see this one, uh, from Zygam Azizov, Azizov, sorry for pronunciation. Well, um, in Kant, you know, nature is time. So I don't, I don't really, nature is time and space altogether. So uh, yes, we can say that technology imitates time, but it doesn't change anything to, to the problem in a certain sense, because nature is extension and, and uh, temporality. Uh, and, and the second one uh, you, is uh, that I think you missed is from Tofik. Uh, hello, Tofik. I have two questions. First, it's interesting how you bring together technology, biology, aesthetics. But I think what's not mentioned in is psychology. And hence, what my distinct human beings from machine is not genius or creativity, but the psyche. So do you think that this artificial epigenetic revolution can ever reach acquiring a concept of the psyche. The second one is how can this relation of the technique to itself manifest itself? We know from Heidegger that what distinguishes human beings is this self-questioning reflecting process. So how can it be for technique? So wow, uh, a lot of difficult questions. Uh, you know, if it is true that the production of the categories in Kant are epigenetic, so I, I, we, we don't have time to explain that, but let's uh, uh, take Kant for granted when he says that the production of the, of the mind, in fact, of categories of the mind uh, is epigenetic, then uh, epigenesis is the condition uh, of possibility for the psyche. There, there wouldn't be any psyche or any uh, psychic interiority without this originary uh, production of the self. Hmm? Uh, this is what Kant says in the first critique. So the production of the psyche uh, then is entirely epigenetic. That is, uh, it is a self-differentiated -di development, etc. So, you know, I don't know if this notion of the psyche changes anything in the general picture of, of the talk, you know? Uh, and so um, how can this relation of the technique to itself manif manifest itself? I would say that, but you can, can answer better than I on this point. Um, I would say that it manifests itself um, as autonomy. And I think this is what frightens people when they say, oh, will the machines replace us, etc." Because it is clear that synaptic, synaptic chips or uh, the human brain project, you know, these big computers, uh, this big computer that is uh, gradually simulating a human mind, uh, they look and they are autonomous. And I think that's 
this is what gives us this impression of a self, of something that happens between the machine and itself, like the variation of the intensity, uh, the alternative functioning of energy, like the rewiring of the program. Uh, at some point, you, you, you saw this film about the Go play, the, the play of Go, sorry, uh, in which at some point the machine is improvising a move. You know, um, this is, I would say, what gives this impression of um, uh, the self of technique. I don't know if you want to add something, uh, uh, you Yeah, I think that well, there are two, maybe two different dimensions. One is the self-improvement of techniques and there yes. is self-improvement, yeah. There is a necessity of accidents of catastrophe because the history of technology is the history of catastrophe, we can say. That only through accidents, through failure, the technology uh, improves itself, but also like what Kung Gilem says, that it's only at this moment that the breaking down technology, the science emerged. That was, but, but this is a, a, a Kung Gilem's theory. And the other dimension, of course, is that uh, now when we are dealing with the machines that we are dealing with, they are no longer following a linear causality like what we found in the clock, but rather a machine that has a recursive, recursive non-linearity, non-linear reasoning that we found in machine learning today. You know, how can you train a, a machine learning algorithm to recursively improve itself by fitting uh, noise and fitting wrong data just to improve it? Really? Yeah, so it's because if you see some, uh, you have to fit a lot of noise, for example, to, to change the, uh, uh, the, the algorithm, so it would it wow. increase its accuracy. That's the so the, the moment that the machine, so it's also the, the relation between machine and contingency is no longer the same as what Aristotle thinks, or Agathon thought that machine technique is the overcoming of contingency. No, you're right. Um, and I, I remember that um, uh, Wiener or Ashby wanted to create machines that were able to break and repair themselves. That is um, not to overcome contingency, but on the contrary, to, to, to become contingent in a certain sense. Right. That okay. is to be exposed to accidents and uh, noise, as you say. Uh, yes, I think this is very true. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we are. I, um, so we passed the one on uh, recursivity and contingency. Yeah, yeah. So what what is the next one you see? You. I think that those I saw seems to be different order from what you read. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. So well, maybe what 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 maybe you can choose, uh, Catherine. Oh, I, the the following one on my yeah. screen is. Right but I don't understand it really. Is it possible to end of death by artificial intelligence? I suppose you want to say, Mohammed, is it possible to end or die by artificial intelligence? Something like that, I suppose. But I, I must say, I have no answer to that. I, I, I didn't see this question though. Uh, are you looking at the Q&A or are you looking- I'm, I'm looking at the chat. No, actually, on the, there is Q and A. Uh, if oh, you, uh, oh if you, if you God! Yes, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. So, and there are different questions on both. So, yeah. So that, therefore, yeah, we see different order. <laughs> but if you click the Q and A, then okay. because some I, of I'm the, on the Q and A. Yeah. So you're on the Q and A. You see that? I'm on the Q and A. Right. Uh, so, but the problem is that we have two orders of questions. Right. Anyway. So now I think we are in the same order. We are synchronized by the machine now. Okay, so do you want to read the next one? Yeah, so the next question is order changed um, uh, from uh, Olius uh, Possus. Uh, mm -hmm. Dear Professor Malabu, if the Chanson. Uh, if the transcendental is already technological, would you agree that the epigenesis has an inherently mimetic dimension? Uh, to be found namely in the schematism 
chapter understood not as imitation, but rather in the sense of affinity and adaptation of molding yourself to the object. I believe that such a conception of plastic my message is implied by Adorno in his thinking towards a mimetic rationality. Um, well, you know, this is a very good question. I do think that it has, um, um, that epigenesis has an inherently mimetic dimension. And you're right to quote, or to refer to schematism. Uh, the molding to the object, because the schematism is epigenetically, so to speak, uh, molding precisely to the object. And you remember Heidegger's critique of schematism, which is that, uh, unfortunately, Kant says it is an art hidden in the depth of nature. It, he he doesn't want to, um, to go as far as to say what you say, that is, uh, a schematism is, is a mimesis, well, is epi epigenetically my mystic, he says, oh, we don't know where it comes from, etc. But if we go back to Heidegger, we might say that this is uh, what Heidegger has thematized under the name of uh, imagination, mm -hmm. that in fact, this inherently mimetic dimension uh, of uh, schematism is the work of imagination, of transcendental imagination. I think, in fact, everything we said here today could be um, related to Heidegger's reading of imagination, but that, that would be another. Uh, so it, I would not think directly of Adorno, but uh, Heidegger, the mimetic rationality as transcendental imagination. This is what I would say. I think that Hernan has a, another question, yeah. no? Yeah, so he said, hello, thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to ask Professor Malabu if she thinks it's possible to somehow connect the idea of epigenetic to Aristotelian concept of contingency. I mean, Professor Malibu presented some correlations between behavior, environment, and genetic. I think that we can renew our idea on politics as a creative action that can enhance human life within an open field. And that may also help to avoid the idea that automation is the only way to a better, uh, to a better future. Um, the second part of your question is interesting, but I wouldn't be able to answer it immediately like that. Um, is automation the only way to a better future? Uh, <laughs> I, I think this is impossible to answer by yes or no. You know, this is a huge question. Uh, and I think this is yes and no at the same time. So, but I would reserve my answer. Uh, going back to, to the first part of your question, as you very uh, rightly said, um, I mean, contingency today cannot be reduced anymore to Aristotle concept of contingency. Uh, but um, uh, we, we were, we're, sorry, we, ha we were having this discussion with you before this, the talk started and uh, we were referring to Lacan's uh, um, text called Tuque and Automaton. You know, there are two Aristotelian concepts of contingency. Tuque, which is pure chance. Uh, I go out on the street and meet a friend out of a, a mere chance. This is Tuque. And Automaton is the appearance of Tuque. This is the mimesis of Tuque, which is the repetition of an old schema that seems to be contingent. So for example, I have the feeling of doing something out of chance. And in fact, I'm repeating something. This is the compulsion to repeat. And this is very interesting because already Aristotle had a double notion of contingency and the second one, automaton, included mechanism already, including included the machine. Like, uh, something that looks perfectly uh, uh, contingent is in fact a mechanical repetition. Uh, so if we had something to keep from Aristotle, I would say this is this, uh, uh, the appearance of contingency that in reality is, is a routine, is a uh, iteration, iteration. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I don't know if you want to add something, you Yeah, I think it very, of course, I mean, we cannot uh, use uh, contingency to translate uh, Tiki. Uh, uh, but but the distinction you know between tishi and automaton is automaton is probability you know if you throw a chair to the air and you fall down it should stand or you fall you know automaton but tishi also have another meaning which means chance and luck yeah <laughs> which means luck. luck so so, so <laughs> I think you know I, I, it's a question that intrigued me since a long time is how can we articulate the question of luck. <laughs> Uh, in, in 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 with the machines, you know, if we take in uh, what you what you what you say about the uh, machines and and where can we still identify the question of teaching, you know, because teaching is when I go to the street and I meet someone, yes. that, you know, the borrowed money from me for ten years ago and I completely forget and then when I saw him, he gave me back my money, you know, that's luck. <laughs> <laughs> Something that never happens, by the way. Right. <laughs> Um, so there is so another, where are we? I'm lost. I'm sorry. A question from uh, from Martha Stavning Eslev. Um, what do you think about the emerging artistic genre of bot mimicry, where human mimic machines that mimic humans? If these machines imitate humans, what happens when humans imitate them? What do you um, think about the recent, the same person, what do you think about the recent critique of the mystification of AI that argue the AI system, in particular those based on machine learning, especially, specifically deep learning neural networks cannot be thought to be anything more than statistical machineries that imposes that statistical culture in addition to perpetuating biases, discriminatory structures and an unchanging historical condition. Oh, this is too complicated for me. <laughs> the second one, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know. Are you, in fact, this, me? well, the question is that um, AI would not be, um, politically emancipating or emancipatory, but they would just reproduce uh, the kind of um, uh, oppressive and repressive political structures, um, capitalistic structures. Is that, I, I think this is the sense of the, of the question that in fact, there is no real creation, as you said. I, I, I think the question that's really referred to the current debate on an AI, which claims that actually in AI, we can find a lot of biases. So uh -huh. AI is a full bias, for example, an AI used to identify criminals, for example, or potential yes, yes, criminals. Yes, yes, I see. And, and so it's basically a use of a statistic method to identify who should be or who, who would be the suspect. Uh, so I think the question uh, for you is like, uh, uh, no, that is not, you know, AI cannot be understood in this way or AI cannot be reduced to it. Yes, reduced to it, certainly not. Yeah. Uh, even if we, we can ask ourselves whether AI is uh, the way it is, um, processed hmm? uh, today, we may ask ourselves whether it is uh, uh, a capital reproductive, well, capitalist reproduction, I don't know, or, or if it really uh, opens a future, and this refers to the previous question, you know, I don't know, yeah. um, I don't know. Uh, so what about some um, imitation and machines imitate humans, what happens when humans imitate them? Uh, but it seems to me that humans always uh, imitated machines. Uh, isn't the Bergson's text on lo laughing? I think this is about huh? this is this is about that. No, that is um, what 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 make what makes people laugh is the imitation of the mechanical by the living being. Am I right? Um, mechanical gestures, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's not entirely a new, a new question, I think. 
I mean, this is also a, a phenomenon that we already observed, for example, many years ago in Japan, where the otaku, uh, they do kind of dance, and they dance like machines. So their, 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 their entertainment is to dance, you know, not all, but some of them has this, uh, as was part of the popular culture to imitate machine uh, dancing. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, now so it's another in, question in French, but in while you French. are reading, I try to translate it into English. So, so thank you for your exp uh, for your for your talk. I'm uh, I firstly uh, agree with the idea of a lack of uh, terminology for, to describe the phenomenon related to cybernetics and to artificial intelligence and to the uh, to the digital machine fun fun uh, functions. However. I allow myself to introduce one that is a, a simulation difference from imitation or a form of imitation and which is an a, a, a informational uh, process in its relation uh, to the question to the artistic questions, some elements in the book that appear in 2012, simulation, a technological simulation, artistic materialization, published mm -hmm. by Amaton, uh, a book I don't know. No, I don't know, thank you. I, I, I took note of it. Okay, from, uh, it's by Nathalie Delpra and Christian. Yeah. Well, I, okay, thank you so much, Colette. Yeah. Where's so, the question? Yes, yeah. you go, go ahead. So then the next question, so thank you for the remark. And then- the Yes, thank you. Uh, from Riddick, uh, uh, Rodrigo, Rodrigo uh, Faustini, would you relate epigenesis to cybernetic autopoiesis and self-regulation to self-plasticity? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, but I think Colette has another question about Turing, you know, the Turing's test. Um, can machine think was Alan Turing's yeah. question, of course. Um, and to go back to what happens when human mimics machines, uh, and when machines mimic humans, it makes me think of uh, the movie uh, Ex Machina, in which it is the machine who submits the human being to the Turing test. So it's an interesting film for that. So, uh, Rodrigo, would you relate epigenesis to cybernetic autopoiesis and self-organization to self-plasticity? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, autopoiesis is a very interesting uh, concept. Even if, I mean, when Varela defined it, Varela and Maturana, uh, it was about, uh, yes, the self-constitution of, uh, of a being, but I think they did not really um, integrate the influences from, well, the external influences. Autopoiesis was, and self-regulation, were thought as loops, uh, as regulating loops with no real intervention of the outside, I would say. So I think we can keep autopoiesis, but add everything that comes from the environment, et cetera, et cetera. And self-organization to self-plasticity, yes, but again, self-organization to the extent that it integrates things, I say things because it can be many things, coming from uh, outside. Okay. So there is other question, but I think maybe you address already. So uh, you uh, from, from Segam at Sizov. Ah, yes, uh, yeah. Yes, we already. Yes, yeah. already. Yeah, yes. And uh, uh, Taufik, is, Taufik as well. Already. Yeah. So who goes sir? Contemporary attentional problems and possibilities defines in a, a materialistic way the limits between human self and environmental exigencies among the machines, devices, algorithms, etc. Can we think in a kind of hybrid epigenetics? And if it is the case, what kind of ethical practice it is possible to necessary to imagine? Let me reread it. Mm -hmm. um, 
in a, yeah, in a certain sense, I would say that all epigenesis is a hybridation uh, because, um, as you know, the, the, the first uh, appearance of the term in, in modern uh, biology, epigenesis, was a, a, a political position uh, against preformationism. Uh, there were two theories. The embryo is already preformed and just develops in size and volume. And on the other side, you had epigenetists who defended the idea that an embryo uh, different, um, is developed out of self-differentiation. And self-differentiation always includes more or less a hybridation. That is something that is unexpected. Um, and the invention of something uh, like a new, new being that hybridates uh, the genes from the parents. So I would, um, of course, I understand what, what you mean, hybrid in the sense of uh, uh, half technological, half natural epigenesis, but this concept of hybridation is perhaps uh, originary. Um, and what kind of ethical practices? Of course, uh, we know that the main, one of the main problems raised by IA today is that of uh, responsibility, is that of uh, how far should we go? Uh, what kind of ethical uh, paradigm can we build out of that? But if we admit that in a certain sense, everything is technological, that thinking is technological, that speculation is technological, then the ethical problem is not specific to uh, machines, no? to technology, but in fact is the problem of ethics in general. Uh, I have, it's very difficult for me to see why people insist so much on uh, ethical, the ethical dimension of technology uh, and tend to separate it from ethics in general. For me, uh, ethics is ethics. It's not more related to technology than to anything else. I don't know what you think, you, but. Well, I mean, I have a big problem with that because I think today when we say philosophy and technology, then immediately people think about ethics of technology. So the own the function, the, the you know, the function of technology, the philosophy become ethics of technology, and this is what is really happening. Uh, if you go to an AI conference, you know, there is a, a panel dedicated to. Uh, philosophy and that is called ethics of AI, for example. So, uh, um, I, I this is also a question trouble me, and that's why I also ask you know in my response to to, to you, I try to address, and also that is the aim of the whole series to address the relation between philosophy and technology beyond ethics. <laughs> I totally agree. Uh, we we are stuck in this question uh, that once again seems to. Uh, uh, isolate regions of ethics uh, and specifically uh, the technological one. I think it is a way of um, uh, denying uh, everything that I can bring, you know, include, including ethically <laughs> on the ethical right. level. So yeah, I, I, we resist this question, <laughs> let's say. So then uh, the next one, is it possible to end up, to end death by artificial intelligence? Uh, you, you read this question before, but I think what he was uh, pointing to, if I understand correctly, is the uh, thesis of uh, Kuzfai, who, who, who believe in that in 2025, we can attend immortality <laughs> through, uh, yes. uh, with AI. Um, and the idea that you know, with uh, with uh, the arrival of singularity, and then I think the question of singularity, of course, is the transhumanist response to the question of the psyche, or the possibility of psyche in uh, in machines. Uh, so, is it possible to end death by artificial intelligence? Ah, okay. So we become and death by a oh yeah. yes oh, thank you well, I, I've no I've no idea but I think no <laughs> 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 who can be a hundred percent sure but but I would say no <laughs> right so there's the other question there's a long one 
Hello, everyone. I think it is either a clarificatory question because I was able to follow the conclusion in terms of relation and machinic structure having a relation to themselves and at least, at least, at least, at least, yeah, at least with their own processes, regardless of we think them having a self or not having a self within the scope of self of a human being. Yet I'm a bit puzzled with the idea of the self and the role it plays in our understanding of the artificial epigenetics. I simply cannot comprehend the idea of the self. And I find it quite a big of presupposition to rest any argument upon. So I have two questions. One is that what are your thoughts on a human being having a self? Since the any process of my message seems to need the self to rest upon or self to return to, to return to, be it nature, artificial, mechanic, biological, etc. And second, what are the qualifications? from your perspective for a human being to have a self because i'm also thinking that we as human beings may be projecting a future self where the information process and second what are also the same and so uh, and second what are the qualifications from your perspective for a human being to have a self because i'm also thinking that we as human beings may be projecting a future self and then building plastic structure in order to be able to imitate what we had imagined as future self. And what would then my methods be rest upon? And also the self a priori under these futuristic wishes. <laughs> Thank you, you um, Of course, it, it, it's always difficult, as you know, to define the self. Uh, it is the uh, one of the main topics of uh, analytic philosophy. Is there anything like a personal identity? Uh, for many uh, Anglo-Saxon thinkers, the self is an illusion. Consciousness is an illusion. There is no personal identity. There are only mental events um, that are succeeding, that are um, in succession. Uh, but nothing like uh, an ego or an I or a self. So if we understand the self as something like a substance, um, of course, I would agree with you that it is very challengeable and that perhaps such a thing does not exist. What I meant in my talk by the self was just, if I may say just, the capacity for a system be it natural or artificial, uh, a system to relate to itself, uh, to engage in a relation. In fact, the self for me is a series of relations. It is not something that exists per se, uh, once again, as a substance or an essence. It is um, a synthesis of relations. And uh, what can be called the human self is the capacity, uh, is this capacity to create a loop, a, a recursive loop that engages a relation to, uh, to be in relation to, this is what a self is. And the question was, is uh, a, a system able to uh, develop that kind of uh, uh, relationality? That was the sense of my question. Uh, not at all, once again, I didn't think of the self like as something really, uh, yes, substantial. Hmm. Right, so I think it's, uh, the question assumes that you have a really substantial concept of the self, like a human uh, psychological self. But uh, Yes, and it was not at all my... That's not, yeah. yeah. So then there is uh, uh, from a, a greeting from Moise. Yes, uh, Moises, who was a former student. Yeah, uh, uh, Moises, I, I, nice to see you, if I may say, yeah, see nice you. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's a great pleasure for me too. And I yeah. hope you're well. <laughs> yeah, thank you for, for attending. We met two years ago in Brazil. 
Oh, so, yes, you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We met. Uh, so there's another question about for me is to ask me to open an account in Billy Billy. Oh, well, please write to me because I don't have the ID card that allow me to open a channel. Of, what is uh, Billy Billy? Billy Billy is a, a, like a YouTube uh, thing in China that people can watch a live stream and uh, it has a lot of audience. Uh, a talk can host like up to 5,000 or 10,000. Oh, wow. so. But I don't have the document, so please uh, write me an email. <laughs> Uh, another one is from uh, Chantel uh, Gray. Could you say that there is a kind of human mimicry of machines, or at least the machine models that statistically aggregate human data and are then deployed across society, forming a kind of attractor in the phase space of recursive system, second order cybernetic system? I'm thinking here of the work of people like Dan McKillan on machinic neoplatonicism, as well as Pasquinelli's work on the ways in which machine models are not are new modes of model modes of social and being ontological normalizations. For me, this goes deeper than questions of bias towards question of subjectivation. Um. Can you answer, Yuk? Because I don't know. I'm sorry, this is a beautiful question, but I don't know. Um, well, I, I think you know. Works, yeah, so. I, I, I think this is some evidence. You know, if you look at the case of Google, you know, Google ah, yes. poses oh. very much a second order cybernetic system, if we can say that, that it operates. The search results that it generates, also recommendation, you search, it, it proposes, and all the whole system is based on a kind of recursive second order. Uh, cybernetic system and it is a social as well as a political uh, so it does you know it, it's a google of course it already knows what kind of normalization it's aiming mm -hmm. for and it adjusts itself by changing its algorithms and so so it's facebook you know there's uh, facebook just uh, run into uh, problems in the in the recent years because of its algorithm so i think this is a Quite, uh, evident uh, question, but I, I mean, how can we analyze this? That seems to me uh, has a, it's, it's a, a important sociological questions. So, uh, in, uh, what is the you what is a second order? So, second order cybernetics. Uh, so, for example, the first order cybernetics are related to people like Vienna and Ashby and so on. <laughs> So, for example, they use where their focus was more more on machines. Uh, for example, on the feedback and information process to understand the operation of machines. But in the second order, cybernetics associated with people like uh, uh, von Foerster, Nicholas Luhmann, systems theory, uh, but Verena uh, Maturana. Oh, okay. So they, okay. they tends to use this model to to uh, uh, where different people have their different tech, but the way they're trying to use cybernetic model to apply in the whole society. Okay. So in linguistics, in uh, social analysis, in politics and so on. So um, uh, they use less and less the term uh, feedback, but more and more the term recursion. So, for example, okay. in Lumen, you found uh, the, 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 the Gesellschaft, the Gesellschaft is all about because the society of the society. Um, so there is an anonymous uh, atten attendant. Uh, my question is to stimulate you to explore, extrapolate from the writing of David Gunko in terms of creolization, cre hybridization, function of autopoiesis. I must say that I don't know these writings. Yeah, um, so, uh, but creolization, of course, interesting, uh, related yes. to uh, Grison and so on, but I also cannot address this question. So the other one could you be, could be the relation to self and attention concept in modern AI has been transformed after the paper, attention is all you need. Uh, 2017, Ashin Vashvani et al., which is the Transformers architecture, which is based many modern models emerging now. The architecture are now rec are not recursive, but it exploits the mechanism of extension, weighting the significance of each part of input data instead a recursive 
network loop system. Thank you. I don't. I. I don't know. I. I must admit that I don't know about this paper. Um. So no, it is interesting. I mean, yeah. the uh, question of attention. Yeah, like a machine paying attention to itself. Yeah. Um. Now that's interesting. Yeah, we have to think about it. Right, right. I, I think that it is, is it a machine paying attention to itself? If machine paying attention to itself, then it is already looping. <laughs> um, yes. So, uh, so I think we, we, we have gone through all the questions. I think so too. Yeah, so I think we have all the questions. Uh, do we, yeah. Well, anyway, thank you, because they were all very beautiful questions, very difficult. Yeah. Um, I wish I could have been uh, more able to answer some of them. Uh, well, thank you. Um, uh, I think there was the last question, maybe the last question. Would it be fair, from Nicola Fazio, would it be fair to categorize epigenesis as a suturing? I don't know. Or high, Hi, hybridizing technology in its own right. In other terms, would it be incorrect to call epigenetic mimesis a te technology? If so, what distinguishes epigenetic mimesis as a condition rather than a technology? It is true that um, scientists talk about uh, epigenetic mechanisms to designate um, the, the work, the operation of epigenesis. Um, so yes, you're right, in a sense, it is a suturing. Uh, it is um, a suturing uh, between DNA and the phenotype. And in a sense, it is also hybridation, as I said before, because out of the code, they do something. These mechanisms create, creolize, if you want, um, individuals. Uh, so in that sense, you're right. Why maintain um, the frontier between natural and technological epigenetics? But th this was precisely the, the meaning of my question. Perhaps we have to go beyond the divide uh, and, and, and accept that perhaps the frontier between the natural and the artificial is totally blurred. Um, but I agree with you that from mm. the beginning, yes, we can see um, epigenesis and epigenetic mechanisms as uh, techniques of suturing. I agree. I, I, I only add one point, and is that because I think there, there might be uh, something very we still have to think through is the question of tendency mm -hmm. in uh, epigenetics as a technology and epistem. Ep, epist uh, epi epigenetic in the sense of uh, Waddington, because the, when you talk about canalization, it's, you know, it's like a ball rolling down a, a slope. You know, there is a certain tendency that is moving towards. So when we think of it as a technology, it becomes the question of tendency become it become less evidence, and it has to be to be probably to be articulated. You know, to what you know how how we we articulate the question of tendency. You mean tendency is uh, um, the tendency to go that way rather than this? Yeah, yeah, because the okay. canalization that, that is, like, is like a ball on a loop. Yeah, that, that goes, not, yes. Yeah, it will not go up, you know, it, it has a tendency to go down, for example. Yeah. So uh, that, that, that is probably the complications. So uh, we have answered all the questions. Great. So, well, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, yes, thank for you. the wonderful talk and the discussion. And uh, thank everyone who, who joined us and stay till the end with us. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, Catherine, we'll be in touch again by email. <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. And, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Yuki. It was wonderful. Uh, it was a great moment. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you. It was a, it was a pleasure. It was a great pleasure. So, uh, bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Take care.